good evening to all from epicons friends of concrete to this webinar 117 on analysis design and detailing of shear walls uh, the topic don't doesn't need any separate preamble as such uh, all of you almost all of you are, are knowing that that is a extension of uh, the our last webinar on that was 116 on analysis design and detailing for multi storied building high rise structures and that time it was decided that um, there since there are a lot of issues related to shear walls shear walls rather i'll call them as structural walls are the most um, uh, complicated and uh, cumbersome issues of modern buildings so we'll have a separate uh, session on shear wall so we are having this uh, separate session <coughs> uh dr yogendra singh also doesn't need any separate introduction all now we are familiar with him i'm not going to do his separate introduction as such i'm just uh, giving him his introduction in some different way that is the uh, that is the participation of last uh, webinar so last webinar 116 what we conducted there were participation from what you are seeing on the, uh, uh, the presentation that is india registration is from 25 states and three union territories and there was international registration from australia bangladesh malaysia saudi arabia sri lanka usa one each nepal four numbers and uae two numbers and you can see the all the states have having uh, representation in last year last uh, seminars uh, viewership so that introduction is enough is uh, of a uh, proof of his popularity so i don't think he is needs any separate introduction by the way he is senior professor in iit roorkee and i'll just uh, i'll not read this intro introduction and uh, ask him straight away to start the topic uh, please put your questions in q a box and not in chat box because it's better to uh, we can read it at one place please don't put it in chat box please put in questions all up in our qa box thank you thank you mr parulekar can i start yeah hi okay so good afternoon uh, i welcome you all and thank you so much for joining uh, this evening for this topic so i will start sharing my screen i hope all of you can see the screen and uh, also hear me uh, clearly yes so, uh, last month uh, when i committed for this uh, talk a separate talk on uh, shear walls i was thinking that whether we will have enough material to have a separate talk on this topic but when i started collecting the material and then i discovered finally and you will see so much work has been done and so many issues are already identified that i am not sure whether i will be able to complete the full material which i have covered okay. or not in any case i will share uh, the pdf of this ppt with all of you and whosoever is interested so you can go through that but most of the questions which you are asking i will try to answer those so when we talk about shear walls for that matter shear wall all of us know so i am not introducing formally the what is shear wall so we know that it is rcc wall uh, in general a rcc wall we call a shear wall and it is registering the vertical and the lateral load so lightly or loosely any rcc wall we are calling a shear wall but actually the wall which is subjected to lateral load which is registering a lateral shear that we should call shear wall and uh, another uh, uh, paradoxical situation is that actually the shear wall is mainly registering the load by bending so a better name for a shear wall uh, should have been a bending wall so with that little introduction let's see the first question which comes to our mind or which is also being asked by many people is how to differentiate between a column and a shear wall and at what aspect ratio what uh, width to thickness ratio of the cross section we can uh, treat a column as a shear wall so to answer this i am showing you here the moment distribution 
in a frame. So left hand side is showing the moment distribution in columns and right hand side is showing the moment distribution in beams. So this is a typical moment distribution in a column. And what we see here that there are points of contraflexion in the middle of each story. And uh, the bending moment at the top and bottom is maximum and the column can yield at top and bottom. Somebody may say that uh, if we have designed a strong column and weak beam, then uh, the column should not yield. But that's also not true. Even if we have designed our columns 1.4 times stronger as it is there in our code IS 13920, even then after yielding of beams and due to higher mode effects, the columns are susceptible to yielding at top and bottom in each story. And that's the basic difference. So in case of column, the possibility of yielding, possibility of formation of plastic hinges is there at top and bottom. On the other hand, in case of a shear wall, this is the typical banding moment diagram what is shown in the middle figure. Even if it is connected to the beams, then due to the beams joining, there is a jump in the moments uh, at the floor level, but still it is following a shape in which the maximum bending moment is occurring at the bottom and the possibility of uh, plastic hinge formation is at the base. Rather, we design our shear walls in such a way that these are yielding only at the base. There is a possibility if the shear walls are not designed properly, then there is a possibility of yielding of the shear walls in high, at higher levels, but we will ensure through capacity design that the yielding is occurring at the base only. So the difference between column and shear wall cannot be made based on uh, the aspect ratio of the cross section. Uh, any length to thickness ratio, we cannot declare it as a shear wall. The difference comes from the bending moment diagram. Like you see in the previous figure and this figure, there is a uh, characteristic difference in the bending moment diagram of a shear wall. And uh, incidentally, the shear wall, which I have shown here, this is a coupled shear wall. Coupled shear wall is very much like frame. So um, the two side shear walls, we can treat like two white columns, but it's still the proportion of the coupling beams and the shear wall is such that the bending moment which we are getting in a shear wall is like this. So if in any member we are getting this type of bending moment where we can design it to have yielding only at the base, we will treat it as a shear wall. Otherwise, if there is a possibility of uh, formation of the hinges at top and bottom in all the stories, then it is to be treated as column. Then here, this is a, a shear wall connected by frame. So it is a frame shear wall connection. And there also, th there is a possibility of uh, changing the direction in the top portion. So because of the frame shear wall interaction, we know in the top portion, uh, the shear wall is loaded in the opposite direction. So due to that, the shear wall, the direction of the banding moment in the shear wall may change in the top portion, but still the shape of the banding moment diagram is like this. And uh, we design it using an envelope, uh, what is shown here by this uh, straight line. Uh, I will explain this in more detail in later slides. But we develop a, a banding moment envelope in such a way that the yielding is allowed only in the bottom portion or only at the base of the shear wall. And in the top portion, the strength is protected so that the yielding does not occur. Different types of shear walls um, are there. So there was some question that whether can we provide uh, um, uh, openings in the shear walls? Yes, openings can be provided in shear walls and uh, different layouts of opening are possible. If we arrange the openings vertically, then it becomes a coupled shear wall. We can have openings arranged in a regular and, and sometimes even in a regular uh, pattern. And that can also be a shear wall that can also be designed. Then we can have a squat shear wall in low rise walls when the height to uh, length ratio is greater than two, then we term it as slender wall. And when it is greater than, oh, sorry, when it is less than one, then we term it as a squat shear wall. So in low rise buildings, there is a possibility of having a squat shear walls. The mode of failure in case of a squat shear wall is shear. So it requires a special consideration in reinforcement when it is a 
short shear wall or a squared shear wall and when it is slender shear wall then the mode of failure the predominant mode of failure is flexure and there the reinforcement detailing is different for example in case of a squared shear wall we will provide some inclined reinforcement also in addition to horizontal and vertical reinforcement the reinforcement should also be provided along the diagonals at the 45 degree uh, in case of a slender shear wall the reinforcement should be uh, concentrated or lumped at least part of the reinforcement should be lumped near the boundaries and the boundaries these vertical boundaries which we know as boundary elements those are uh, confined those have to be confined then different shapes of the shear walls are also possible uh, the most common is the rectangular shape now we are having very thin shear walls also so for thin shear walls it is necessary that the ends should be enlarged so these boundary elements in this case will have larger size than the shear wall if the thickness of the rectangular shear wall is sufficient then the boundary elements may be embedded within the shear wall then we can have shear walls in any shape so we can have flange sections we can have c type l type i type and uh, the efficiency we will discuss later efficiency of the flange or non planar shear walls is more because these uh, walls which are perpendicular to the other walls these act as flanges and due to these flanges the efficiency increases and uh, we can also have a shear wall in the form of cores so different shapes of cores c u etc are used in especially in tall buildings where the services lift and the staircase can be um, uh, encompassed it can be um, enclosed inside a shear wall core and this shear wall core will provide uh, added stiffness and strength to the building now the third question which has been asked is that uh, uh, what is the ideal location of the shear wall so the ideal location of the shear wall is two rules we have to follow and those rules are that the shear wall should be placed symmetrically in the plan and what do we mean by symmetrical symmetrical doesn't mean that it has to be exactly at the same location the symmetry means that the center of stiffness should coincide with the center of mass because if these are not coinciding center of stiffness is not coinciding with the center of mass there will be torsion so we want to avoid torsion so for example if you see the first building first plan so here the shear walls have been arranged in a symmetric manner but it is not necessary that the opposite base have to be provided with the shear wall we have to arrange these shear walls in such a way that the center of stiffness and center of mass should coincide and if we can provide uh, shear walls in flange or in um, l shape or uh, in any other shape then the efficiency will increase that we discussed earlier so the other rule to provide shear walls is that these should be provided as far away from the center as possible i will explain this why this is important the distance from the center the distance from the center is important because this enhances the torsional stiffness and torsional capacity of the shear wall and when the shear wall is uh, provided away from the center the torsional stiffness increases in case of a shear wall building alone when we are having a building having shear walls no columns then this can be an ideal arrangement what has been shown on the right hand side now how this ideal arrangement works that i will explain with the help of this figure so here the shear walls have been provided there are five shear walls a to e and we can see that in uh, vertical direction these are symmetrically placed but in uh, horizontal direction these are not symmetrically placed but these are placed in such a way that the center of mass and center of stiffness is coinciding so that there is no torsion now when this building is subjected to an earthquake force in the north south upward direction then these two shear walls shear wall a and b those are going to resist this force and their resultant should act opposite and in the same line at the same point as this applied earthquake force similarly when we apply a force in east west direction then the shear walls cd and e are going to resist it again the 
moment of these forces about this center of mass should be equal. Okay, so the resultant should pass through this E. It should oppose the applied force at the same point. Now, when it is subjected to torsion, even if the building is symmetric, still it can be subjected to torsion due to uh, some unforeseen regions. For example, there is a torsional component in the ground motion and there can be accidental uh, eccentricity in the building. So when it is subjected to torsion, then all the walls will try to oppose that torsion. And we can see that the torsional resistance will depend upon the force and the distance from the center. So this distance from the center is important. So when we are uh, uh, providing shear walls, we should provide in such a way that these are this lever arm of these forces is as far away as possible. Sorry, I'm coming back. Okay, but this ideal location of the shear walls, which we have discussed, may not be possible in all the cases because shear walls are permanent partitions. So, uh, and these block uh, the view and uh, ventilation. So, from functional regions, what we think as ideal may not be feasible, may not be practical. So, there are some practical ways of providing shear walls, which are shown here. For example, in the first case, the shear walls are provided in one direction only. So if shear walls are provided in one direction, then it's the stiffness of the building in the other direction will not be uh, of the same order. So that needs to be compensated by providing a shear wall core. If we are not able to provide shear walls at the perimeter, we can provide the shear walls at the core. And when we are providing at core, the closed core has much larger torsional stiffness as compared to the four separate shear walls. So if we are providing uh, the shear walls at the center, very near to the center, then uh, it is preferable that we close them together. And uh, perfectly closed uh, core again is also not usable because we need uh, doors and doors to access the uh, staircase and uh, um, um, elevators. So we can have a couple shear walls. So here we can provide coupling beams. So openings may be there, but we should try to close it together so that we get good torsional resistance. So in case of a circular shape buildings, we can provide circular shear walls like this, and we can arrange the shear walls in uh, this type of situation also, where openings are provided either at the corners or we can provide openings in the middle also. So practically, we have to compromise on the location of the shear walls, but the principle of providing shear wall remains same, that it should be provided symmetrically about the center of mass, so that the center of stiffness coincides with the center of mass, and these should be provided as far as possible from the center, so that the torsional resistance is uh, better. Then another issue is uh, regarding what we should call as pier and spandrel, because when we are having um, shear walls of different shapes and openings, it becomes difficult to identify uh, piers and spandrels. So these piers and spandrels are defined by physical boundaries. So what you see here in the first figure, these horizontal segments, these are spandrels or coupling beams. So these are to be designed as spandrels. And these are connecting the vertical piers so the connections between vertical piers are these. And similarly, what are vertical piers, which are continuous along the height? So these what are shaded in the second um, figure, right side figure, these are the vertical wall segments and these vertical wall segments are called piers. So what is shown in the uh, right side figure, these are piers and what is shown in the left side pier, these are spandrels. And uh, their detailing, and reinforcement placement in the two is different. Then what are the modes of failure which have been observed in the past? So one of the modes of failure which has been observed in the past is crushing of concrete because uh, of the bending and shear, the concrete can be subjected to large stresses. 
And uh, when the shear wall is attracting a lot of vertical force also, it has large vertical force also, and then it is subjected to bending. So there is a possibility that concrete gets crushed. And for that, the confinement is necessary. And uh, usually in codes, it is shown that only the boundary element is confined. So here you can notice that this figure I have taken from ACI 318, that not only the boundary element, but the back portion also needs to be confined. And uh, when we are confining it, then the concrete can resist larger stresses, especially in the compression zone. So when the shear wall will be subjected to bending, the um, extreme portion of the shear wall, which is subjected to compression, will be subjected to strains much larger. And uh, how long this boundary element should be? So we know unconfined concrete can sustain a strain up to roughly 0 0.003. It falls at 0 0.0035 or 0 0.004. And uh, the peak strength is obtained at a strain of 0 0.002. So we can safely use unconfined concrete up to a strain of 0 0.002. And uh, wherever we expect the strain to exceed 0 0.002, we should try to confine it. We should confine it. Because there, the chances of spalling will occur. And uh, 0 0.0035, definitely, it is not going to sustain uh, without uh, the confinement. So uh, in Eurocode, the length of the boundary element is obtained in terms of a strain. So we perform a section analysis, calculate the strain in the uh, concrete, and the region in which the strain is more than 0 0.002, we try to confine it. But uh, in Indian code, uh, that is simplified. And in Indian code, this is replaced by stress, because it is easier to calculate stress if we assume the gross section. So Indian code says that we can calculate the stress, concrete stress on the gross section. And when we calculate that stress and that ex stress exceeds 0.2 FCK, 0.2 times uh, FCK, then we have to confine it. In uh, ACI 318, this is 0.2 times FC dash. So a difference of 20% comes there. We have taken the same value of 0.2, but that is applied there on uh, FC dash. Here it is applied on FCK. And cube strength and cylinder strength, there is a 20% difference. So we are already on non-conservative side. And um, it can be uh, stopped when the stress in the equivalent or in the gross section reduces to uh, 0.15, 15% of the FCK, or 15% of the cylinder strength, actually, which is in ACI uh, 318. So that gives us the length. Uh, which needs confinement and where we should provide boundary elements. But the role of the boundary elements is not only in confinement. It has another role, which I will explain to you. So what you can see here, uh, there, there are different arrangements of confinement possible as compared to the previous figure. So these two types of arrangements are shown in ACI 318. In the first case, there is one circular hoop, oh, sorry, one uh, rectangular hoop, and there are ties. And when this length of this uh, boundary element is uh, less than two times the thickness, so BC is the thickness or width of this boundary element. So if it is less than two times, then we can use single, uh, a single rectangular hoop. Otherwise, we have to go for multiple hoops like this, where individual uh, hoop dimension is not exceeding two times BC. And uh, these are overlapping at least by uh, one uh, set of bars uh, as shown here. Then uh, in case of non planar shear walls, what should be the zone which is to be confined? So we can see that non planar shear wall can be subjected to uh, bending in both the directions. And accordingly, in first case, the compression will occur in these flanges here when the moment is applied um, about the vertical axis, then the shaded portion will be subjected to compression. And we need uh, confinement at the end of the compression uh, zone. Similarly, here, when the bending moment is subjected in the opposite direction, then the uh, bab portion, it will be subjected to compression. And we will need confinement here. But in reality, the 
A bending moment can come in any direction. So when the bending moment is coming in uh, about a horizontal axis, then the uh, compression zone it will occur here. And we need confinement of concrete in compression zone. And this is reversible. So it will come in both the direction. And actually, there is a combination. And when there is a combination, we have uh, something like this. So we can see that these corners and these ends of the fringes, these are the zones which need uh, confinement, where the strains can go to a large value. Then the effective flange width uh, of the flanges, that is also important to estimate so that we can calculate the capacity of the uh, uh, non-planar wall and uh, the width, the effective width of the flanges not only depends on the dimensions, it also depends on the height. So as we go taller, the effective flange width goes on increasing as it has been shown here. So we can assume that the effective flange width increases at an angle of uh, one horizontal to four vertical. So the slope of one horizontal to four vertical, we can assume to calculate the effective flange width like uh, we are doing in case of slabs. So in the same manner here also the effective uh, flange width goes on increasing from the free end towards the support. So bottom is the supported end if it is a cantilever uh, shear wall and the top is the free. Then there are limits on minimum reinforcement which are to be provided in case of uh, squared shear walls it is 0.25%. In case of slender shear walls it is 0.25% plus depending on the aspect ratio and also uh, in terms of the horizontal reinforcement. So in a squared shear wall, the horizontal and vertical reinforcement should be equal. But uh, in case of a slender shear wall, the horizontal reinforcement may be higher and uh, uh, the difference we, we can take uh, into account from here. Uh, in IS 456, there is another limit given on uh, the minimum reinforcement from the fire protection point of view, but that is separate. Here we are talking about the limits from the earthquake performance point of view. The fire performance is different and that clause is to be followed in addition to this. Then the other failure mode, which has been uh, found lately in uh, Christchurch earthquake is buckling of the shear wall because uh, people are using very thin shear walls and these thin shear walls are susceptible to overall buckling of shear wall within a story. So this shows the failure of the shear wall in outer plane buckling. And uh, we can guess that this can be controlled by controlling the, uh, the thickness of the shear wall. And this buckling occurs due to the cyclic nature of the earthquake. It is not only due to the vertical load, it occurs due to the banding, the reversible banding, because when a wall is subjected to banding, let us say in the first case, it is subjected to force towards right. So what will happen? The left side of this wall will be subjected to tension. And as a result, the steel is going to yield and it will elongate. So the length of the wall, the height of the wall here will incre increase slightly. And when the force reverses this direction, then what is going to happen? This left side edge, which was subjected to tension earlier, will now be subjected to compression. And it has already increased in the length. And due to that, it is going to buckle. And for this, there is limit on uh, the minimum thickness. And uh, in uh, Molly's book, this uh, relationship is given where uh, we can uh, relate the thickness with the strain, how much strain we are uh, permitting. So it is related with the strain. And the usual strain which we permit in our uh, structures is not more than uh, 5%. So the maximum tensile strain which we are permitting in steel due to uh, the cyclic nature of earthquake, because there is phenomena of low cycle fatigue. So maximum strain we permit as 5%. And within this strain, you can see that the critical ratio of H U by B, the height to uh, thickness ratio, it is in this range and it varies 
from depending upon how much strain we permit because this is maximum actually we will allow and most of the courts have this something close to 15. But Mohila has mentioned that um, it's preferable to have HUIB as 10. And uh, you can uh, easily interpret what this means that if I'm having a story height of uh, three meters, then this minimum height in the boundary, in the yield zone, in the plastic end zone should not be less than 300 millimeter. So it is same as we apply for the columns. And some of the people are asking that uh, uh, how to flush the columns with the shear wall. And general impression is that the shear wall thickness should be smaller, much smaller uh, than the columns. But uh, that may not be true. So shear wall also, uh, especially in our country, when we are using shear wall, we are using very thin shear wall. And those shear walls may be susceptible to uh, buckling during uh, earthquake, during under reversible load. So in case of a slender wall, in case of a tall shear wall, in the bottom portion, it is important that we follow this HUIB as 10. Although our code at the moment does not insist on HUIB by 10, Euro code uh, says that uh, generally it should be HUI 15, but if the compression uh, zone in the shear wall is more than 0.2 times uh, LW, the wall length, so if the compression zone is more than this, then the thickness should not be uh, more than HU by 10. Sorry, should not be less than HU by 10. In that case, we, we should follow uh, this HU by 10. So in our code, uh, the minimum thickness is uh, 150 millimeter when it is planar shear wall. And in case of coupled shear walls, it is 300 millimeter. And this 300 millimeter is actually not from the point of view of buckling. It is from the point of view of constructability because in case of uh, coupling shear walls, we may have to provide uh, diagonal, diagonally reinforced uh, coupling beams. And to accommodate those diagonally reinforced coupling beams, we may have to, uh, we, may, we need larger thickness. And that thickness is specified as uh, 300 uh, millimeters. Then the third failure mode, which has been observed in uh, past earthquakes, is shear failure. So shear failure, again, two types of shear failure can occur. One is the diagonal type of shear failure. Then there is a possibility of shear failure occurring uh, at the base in the plastic hinge zone. And there is a possibility of shear failure, which I will talk later, that is in the um, uh, uh, construction joint. So along the construction joint, there may be a possibility of sliding shear failure. So what we can do to avoid this type of shear failure First thing is that the horizontal reinforcement, the shear reinforcement should be sufficient. So we have to design the shear walls for uh, a capacity shear and that capacity shear is to be obtained from the bending moment, bending moment capacity of the shear wall. Secondly, the horizontal reinforcement should be properly anchored into the boundary element. So currently our code does not provide this detail, but in ACI, we have this detail that the horizontal reinforcement needs to be developed fully inside the confined boundary element. So this length should be full development length of, uh, the, of the steel in tension. So we have to properly anchor. Sometimes we just leave it uh, like this, only this portion without any hook and uh, without sufficient length anchored into the boundary element. So there, there is a possibility of this reinforcement slipping out and then it can lead to shear failure because shear fa this reinforcement is going to yield uh, during large shear force. So this has to be developed. If it is uh, capped straight, then this length should be at least LD. If it is being bent, then we can take advantage of the hook, whatever uh, we are getting here. Then I discussed earlier that the requirement of the boundary elements is not only to confine the concrete in the extreme regions where the concrete will be subjected to large strain, large compressive strain. The concentration of the reinforcement at the ends helps not only in increasing the bending moment capacity, because if we are putting larger reinforcement at the ends, then uh, the lever arm, the effective lever arm will increase. And as a result, 
the bending moment capacity will increase, but it not only increases the bending moment cap capacity, it also increases the ductility. How it increases the ductility? That we can understand using this figure. So if the reinforcement is concentrated at the boundaries, then the, we, we can see here the uh, depth of the neutral axis shall be lash. And for the given um, ultimate strain in concrete, the curvature, which we can ultimate curvature, which we can achieve will be larger because curvature is given by the slope of this strain diagram here. So is smaller the depth of neutral axis, larger curvature we can achieve. On the other hand, if we do not have concentration, the reinforcement is at the same spacing. Only thing is that the reinforcement at the end we have confined. So confinement we have provided here, but we have not uh, dumped the reinforcement at the end. Then naturally the uh, neutral axis depth, the length of the zone in compression is going to be larger. And as a result, the ultimate curvature, which we can achieve is less. In terms of the cracking, that can also be physically seen. If we are having uh, this type of curvature and the reinforcement is concentrated here, then the length of the cracks or the width of the cracks will be controlled. So we will have uh, distributed cracks in this case. But if the reinforcement is not lumped, it is lightly reinforced wall. In that case, we, can, we will have uh, the width uh, we will have single or a few cracks which larger uh, width of the crack and as a result the ductility in this case will be less the ductility which we will get in this case will be larger where the cracking is uh, well distributed so this lumping of the reinforcement concentration of the reinforcement towards the boundary helps not it's not only for the purpose of uh, confinement it also helps in enhancing the ductility by increasing, by enhancing the curvature and distributing the uh, cracks. Then um, usually in this range, we concentrate the reinforcement. So we can see that this 0.5 LW, this is in terms of the length of the wall. It is not same as the length of the boundary element because when we were talking about the boundary element, we were talking from the point of view of confinement. So that is related with the strain. And here the, we are uh, talking about this zone in terms of uh, concentration of the reinforcement. So the reinforcement needs to be concentrated in this zone. So these are the locations where we should concentrate the reinforcement. Incidentally, we discussed that the confinement is also needed in these zones. So the same zone for concentration of reinforcement as well as for confinement of the concrete. But these are serving two different objectives. So in IS 13920, as we discussed, that the boundary element is to be provided uh, in the portion where the stress in concrete and that stress we are obtaining uh, using the gross section, um, uncracked gross section, and using that if the stress is exceeding 0.2 FCK, then we have to provide the boundary element. And along the height, we can stop it when uh, the stress falls below 0.1 FCK. In ACI 318, one provision is in terms of the ultimate displacement, which we are getting, the ultimate drift. And another is similar to what we have in our code, that is in terms of 0.2 FC dash and 0.15 FC dash. But here it is FC dash, not FCK. And FC dash is 20% uh, lower than FCK. So actually, we should. Uh, rather than using 0.2 FCK, we should use 0.15 FCK uh, for providing boundary elements. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, schematically, this reinforcement in a shear wall is summarized in this figure, which I have taken from ACI 318. And what we see here in the bottom portion, where we expect the concrete to yield where uh, the concrete will be subjected to strain larger than uh, 0.002, larger than 0.2%. So concrete will be subjected to yielding. There we need to confine it. And this confinement in these boundary elements is similar to what we have in the columns. So the provision of the confining reinforcement, it's same as we have in case of columns because it will be subjected to similar types of strains. And this height 
in which we have to provide this confinement. This given in ACI 3.1a, <coughs> two requirements are there. And uh, based on these two requirements, one requirement is based on the moment to, uh, or what we call shear span. So we divide the moment, ultimate moment by ultimate shear, and one fourth of that we take, or LW. LW is the length. So maximum of these two we use here to provide this. Above this, the concrete confinement may not be required, but still shear reinforcement will be required. And in this portion, uh, we have to provide stirrups. In the top portion, where the shear reinforcement, uh, shear stress reduces uh, within the uh, unreinforced uh, or within the capacity of the unreinforced concrete, there we can stop these stirrups in the boundary elements. And uh, in case of foundations also, if our boundary element is going to the foundation near the edge, near the boundary of the foundation, then the whole length is to be uh, confined. Okay. Otherwise, only 300 if it is inside. So you can um, it with the requirement in IS 13920 about the confinement going into the foundation of a column. So minimum is 300 millimeter, 12 inch in ACI 318. So both are same. And but if it is if this boundary element is close to the boundary of the foundation, then the whole uh, length needs to be confined. If the shear wall is having a boundary, oh, sorry, is having a, an opening, then near the opening, we will have another boundary here. So this becomes a pier between the edge of the shear wall and the edge of the opening. So this edge also needs to be confined similar to a boundary element. So this will also be confined to a bound. On the other hand, the other edge, the stresses may not be that large. So on the other edge, where the stresses are less than 0.2 FC dash, there the uh, special confining reinforcement may not be required. Normal confinement will work. But in case of the thinner pier and which is close to the boundary, so there we can see that the stress expect is expected to exceed 0.2 FC dash. And there we have to provide a special confining reinforcement uh, at the boundary of the opening also. So uh, in addition to the confinement and concentration of the reinforcement, we have also uh, to ensure that there is no splicing in the uh, zone of yielding. Because in the zone of yielding, where the concrete yields, the concrete cracks extensively, the bond will be lost. And if we are doing lap splicing of our reinforcement in that zone, then the reinforcement will slip and uh, we will not get uh, the strength. So in that region, this lap splicing is to be avoided. So this is the region where the lap splicing is to be avoided. This is the most critical region of the shear wall. Below that, it is the foundation and or maybe an outrigger. We will talk about this later. So this is the most critical section. So above this most critical uh, whatever zone we were doing the confinement in that region, we are not providing any uh, splicing. Similarly, below that also up to LD, we should not provide any uh, splicing. So splicing should be outside this. In any case, if the splicing is to be provided here, the bars are to be connected. Those bars should be uh, provided with the mechanical anchors. So uh, lab splicing is not allowed in this region. And uh, along the section, this is the region, the boundary element, okay, where we are not providing, uh, we are not allowing the lap splicing in the bottom portion. So sometimes in detailing, we are leaving the bars, just uh, projecting outside the foundation and the splicing is started from the base. That should not be done, at least in the boundary element. Then I also talked that there is a possibility of shear failure at the construction joint. And one construction joint is uh, just above the foundation. So here, this is one of the failure where the shear wall failure occurred along the construction joint. And the shear behavior at the construction joint is different than the shear behavior where the concrete is integral. So when the concrete is integral, which is shown by the left uh, figure where there is no pre-existing crack. So there the cracking will occur or the tension will occur 
at the along a diagonal so um, this is will fail this will crack under diagonal tension but when there is a pre existing plane of weakness or a plane along which sliding can occur there the shear will be registered by the double action of this vertical reinforcement so this vertical reinforcement should be adequate to provide enough double action so that it can register the shear at this plane and uh, from that point of view in our code also and in all other codes there is a minimum reinforcement required which is passing through the cross section uh, at the construction joint so if we do not have uh, vertical reinforcement provided like this which is adequate for this we have to provide additional vertical reinforcement just at the uh, construction joint so that there is no slip failure at the construction joint now we are coming to uh, a very important uh, aspect in earthquake resistant design of shear walls and that is the dynamic effect this effect is so far not considered in our code and uh, um, many of our designers may not be aware of this till now things are available easily in the code but here the things are not that clear so what happens Uh, when a shear wall is subjected to earthquake force so shear wall acts as a cantilever and in cantilever we expect that the bending moment will be maximum at the base and uh, when the bending moment increases to its yield capacity the bending moment cannot increase beyond that so the bending moment here uh, is governed by the maximum capacity which we provide at the base so whatever bending moment capacity has been provided at the base the maximum bending moment which the shear wall can achieve is equal to that capacity okay but shear wall uh, sorry shear force what happens to the shear force well, if the bending moment is increasing even uh, or the lateral force increases beyond that then what is going to happen the effect is that because it cannot take larger bending moment but uh, because of the dynamic nature of this the shape the deformed shape of the shear wall will change so higher modes will come into picture for example if you see here this is shown the deformed shape so uh, this is lateral force how it is changing so lateral force will depend upon the deformed shape so the deformed shape is such that the higher modes starts coming into picture as a result the bending moment does not increase but the shear force is still increases because the same bending moment is now applied by a different distribution of the force so earlier let us say in the fundamental mode the uh, distribution of the force was like this so cg or point of application of the load was somewhere here so effective height was large so same bending moment was obtained from a lower shear force but what happens here same bending moment can now be accompanied by a larger shear because the effective height has reduced because of the ha higher mode effect so this higher mode effect is important and as a result even though the bending moment in the shear wall is controlled by the capacity we are providing the shear force is not controlled the shear force increases and as a result we have to follow what we call uh, capacity design this capacity design is still not there in our uh, code is 1893 but it is already there in uh, uh, aci and uh, euro code so here what is shown i have taken this from mohile's book so this intensity ratio this is representing uh, the ratio of earthquake intensity at yield and at higher values so when intensity ratio is 0.5 means the earthquake intensity you can take it as a pga for simplicity although intensity can be represented not only in terms of pga in many other uh, methods let us say point this pga is uh, 50% of what will cause yield then we are getting this this curve this is the bending moment uh, diagram if it becomes one that means when yielding is occurring then we are getting this shape and when it becomes two that means the earthquake intensity is two times of that at which shear wall is yielding now you will agree that uh, our buildings can resist earthquakes much larger than um, those uh, at which our shear wall is yielding 
because after yielding also it can resist the forces and due to energy dissipation it can resist much larger intensities but what happens due to higher mode effect the shape of the bending moment changes and as a result not only the bending moment shape changes the shear force which is applied in the wall that also changes so in aci 318 there is a design moment envelope so this is the moment which we are getting from analysis we use cs and vecs this is what we are getting uh, what we are actually providing what what we are designing the corresponding shear force if you take so corresponding shear force is much larger it is amplified and this amplification factor the dynamic amplification factor uh, oh, sorry this is over strength factor and there is a and uh, there is a also a dynamic amplification factor so the shear force for which we are designing is given as omega v uh, capital omega v times small omega v vu so vu is what we are getting from uh, the analysis this is multiplied by this over strength factor the over strength factor is the ratio of the actual strength which you are providing to the strength required so the shear force has to be increased because if we are increasing the moment capacity then the shear capacity also has to be increased in the same proportion but in addition to that it is also multiplied by small omega v that is the dynamic amplification factor because of the higher mode this capital omega v this is provided moment capacity this is ratio of the provided moment capacity to the yield uh, sorry to the uh, ultimate moment capacity which we have obtained from analysis so this is obtained from analysis and this is actually provided and minimum value of this is 1.5 but if it is uh, squared shear wall this is for slender shear wall this is for squared shear wall in case of squared shear wall we are not considering this the reason is that in case of squared shear wall the failure does not occur because of the moment the failure occurs because of the shear so there is no need to provide any uh, amplification for shear in case of low rise shear walls but in case of uh, slender shear walls we have to multiply it by these two factor so this is the value of uh, capital omega v that is 1.5 a small omega v that depends upon the height of the building because how much effect of higher modes will occur will depend upon the height of the building so ns is the number of stories if ns is less than 6 then we will use this expression if ns is greater than 6 the number of stories is greater than 6 then we will use this expression and you can see if if it is a 30 story building then this factor will be 2.3 and it has it is bound by 1.8 so in a 30 story building 80% increase in the design shear force has to occur because of this small v and in addition to that it should also take into account any what we call subjective over strength you have provided so which is equal to 1.5 close to 1.5 if you have not provided excessively large uh, bending moment reinforcement so 1.5 into 1.8 so that much 2.2 Uh, or 2.7 okay so 2.7 times shear force it has to be designed for what you are getting from analysis so this is very important and currently this is missing in our code so this when we are designing um, slender shear walls tall shear walls we have to keep in mind otherwise there is all probability that the shear wall will fail in shear and whatever response reduction factor we are assuming that will not be available but it is not only shear force actually the bending moment also get influenced by this higher mode effect so moile has suggested that this bending moment which is at the base we should continue up to a certain height and it is given more clearly by priestley so priestley conducted a study and uh, in the same manner as we have seen the ir ratio so he has seen that in case of taller walls if it is a 20 story wall and this uh, intensity ratio is 1 we can see that the moment in the mid height range is increasing if we go further if we see here that intensity ratio is twice and which is quite common intensity ratio twice means that uh, our response reduction factor is of the order of 4 because if we take over strength factor of 2 response reduction factor of 4 then the intensity which we are designing our structure 
is actually roughly two times that of the yield strength. So uh, this intensity ratio, the ratio of the seismic intensity, which will be uh, registered by our building to the yield capacity or uh, the intensity of earthquake at which the shear wall is yielding. If that ratio goes to, then we can see that this banding moment becomes almost vertical, roughly up to the mid height. So based on this, what Priestley has suggested, I will come back to this code. What Priestley has suggested that this banding moment envelope, it should be done like this. So whatever banding moment capacity we are having at the uh, base, this is the required moment capacity, which we are getting from the analysis. This is what we are providing because the, we may not provide reinforcement exactly what that is required. So this phi naught is the over strength, the subjective over strength, the reinforcement which we are providing. So this is that over strength. We should continue this up to the mid height. And then beyond that also, we should increase it by what we call tension shift. So by tension shift, this should be increased and we should get an envelope like this. And actually the shear wall should be designed for this envelope. Similarly, in case of uh, shear, the, the, we should increase it by this factor omega v times this phi zero as we have seen in case of ACI 318. And the value of this uh, factor by which this M naught is to be increased, the mid height moment is to be increased. This factor is given like this, which depends upon the ductility ratio. So ductility ratio, we can take a minimum value of two because we are using a response reduction factor of four, then roughly it will be two, at least two. It will be, it may be greater than two. So we can assume the value of mu somewhere between two and three. Uh, so far, uh, this method is not yet adopted in any of the codes which I have seen. That means ACI 318 and Euro code because it is even more conservative than those. I should not say conservative, it, it requires the moment even higher than that. What Eurocode gives, so currently Eurocode is uh, the most developed code in this regard. So here, this A, this curve given by A, this is our moment diagram, which we are obtaining from analysis. This moment at the base is continued up to a height. And this height is what we call tension shift. And this tension shift is a phenomena which happens in case of bridge piers and shear walls when we have a larger dimension. And what happens, the tension or tensile force in the reinforcement increases. And it is governed by the bending moment at a section. So if I have a cantilever shear wall or a cantilever pier, and I'm calculating the tensile uh, force in the reinforcement at a section at height X, let us say from the base. So it will not be governed by the bending moment at height X, it will be governed by the bending moment at some distance lower. That means it will be governed by higher bending moment. And that uh, tension shift is equal to the length, equal to the dimension of uh, uh, that pier or shear wall. So this is the length of the shear wall. So it should be designed for the same bending moment up to this height. And after that, we can join it parallel to this line. And this B becomes the design envelope. We should design it for this. If we have uh, a frame shear wall dual system, then the bending moment in the shear wall is going to change in the top portion like this. And it is reversible. So what we have to do is we, we will have a mirror image of that. Then we will join uh, this portion, uh, the top portion bending moment obtained from the mirror image to the base. And then again, in the same fashion, we will develop a uh, banding moment envelope. And this banding moment envelope is to be used for design as per Eurocode. Similarly, in case of shear, this A curve is giving the shear force requirement, which is coming from uh, the analysis. And this needs to be amplified. And this amplification factor here, we can see it consists of two things, this epsilon. So it is to be amplified by this epsilon and then we have to join it at the top and whatever is the shear force at one third of the height of the shear wall, the top portion should be designed for the same shear force. This is the requirement of uh, Eurocode. 
and this amplification factor depends again on two things one is this mrd by med in euro code mrd by med this is the resistance provided and this is what is required so if we are providing larger moment resistance than the required this is representing the over strength so this is representing the subjective over strength if we provide additional capacity so the shear force is also to be increased accordingly and another one comes because of the higher mode effects and this is sfig value at the corner period what is this corner period tc the corner period tc is the period in the response spectrum where the value uh, drops from the flat portion so this is uh, the value in the peak portion so the peak value of sa and this is the value of sa at the fundamental period so that ratio for example if our building is uh, constructed on rock site and t1 is let us say 1 second then sfig will be 1 and sfig at tc will be 2.5 then this will become 2.5 so 2.5 into 0.1 plus whatever we are providing sum as srss multiplied by the response reduction factor so that much value of epsilon we have to provide here this i discussed earlier to conclude due to the dynamic nature of the earthquake and yielding of the shear wall even if we are doing a time history analysis a linear time history analysis we will not get this effect because this is based upon non linear time history analysis of shear wall and frame shear wall buildings because once the shear wall yields its uh, uh, dynamic property its uh, shape deformed shape changes and due to that the bending moment as well as the distribution of the bending moment as well as the shear force changes uh, it's agreed that the bending moment at the base cannot exceed uh, what you have designed it for maximum it can attain that only but there is a possibility that the bending moment at a higher level exceeds the capacity which you have provided because you have you might have designed using the bending moment of a cantilever and in a cantilever the bending moment reduces rapidly as we go up and if you have provided uh, longitudinal reinforcement as per that bending moment then the shear wall is going to yield somewhere in the middle also first it will yield at the base and then a hinge will form at the middle you may ask if it yields at the middle what is the problem the problem is that you might not have designed that location also with a special confinement in that case you have to provide a special confinement throughout the height so that when it is developing plastic hinges in the middle there should be adequate confinement special confinement available adequate ductility available that is one issue another issue is if a shear wall is yielding in the middle and there is another shear wall which is yielding at the base the energy dissipation in the shear wall which is yielding at the base is large so we have to ensure that the shear wall should yield at the base not in the middle now people are talking about uh, designs of the shear walls will with multiple hinges so that we can provide uh, uh, special confining reinforcement not only at the base but let us provide at the other locations also where there is a possibility of uh, yielding of the shear wall uh, but still that is not fully developed it's only in the research area and uh, what we have to ensure is that the shear wall should yield at the base and it should yield only in flexion not in shear and that can be done by capacity design using these envelopes incidentally yesterday only i presented this in our code committee cd39 there was a meeting and uh, hopefully something will come in our code also because currently our code is missing capacity design of shear wall totally and uh, now we are constructing taller buildings and uh, using shear wall so this is a must now another question which has also come from the participants is out of plane forces currently the codes not only our code but most of the code those are silent about uh, the out of plane behavior of uh, the shear walls so traditionally the shear walls are considered to resist earthquake forces in their own plane now then what is happening in out of plane in out of plane there is another set of shear walls which is very rigid in that direction and the stiffness of these shear walls is much less in out of plane as compared to in plane especially after cracking so the effect of cracking on out of plane stiffness is more later i will discuss that what uh, factor we should take to modify the stiffness 
to take into account tracking in in an outer plane then it will be even more clear so the stiffness of the shear wall is smaller in outer plane and the effect of tracking is also more and if we have the uh, shear walls in the perpendicular direction also then the forces which will flow which will be registered by the shear walls in outer plane action will be small so bending moments in outer plane will be small and accordingly we can ignore but the recent studies have shown that it's not always uh, safe to ignore that outer plane uh, moment and outer plane moment should also be considered that can be considered by taking uh, p m1 m2 in interaction rather than considering a pm interaction let's have biaxial or bidirectional moment interaction axial force bidirectional moment interaction so p m1 m2 interaction like we are having in columns and a similar method we can use so the method is same it follows two principles equilibrium and compatibility so what we use in case of columns plane sections remain plane then we calculate the variation of strain and we develop pm1 m2 interaction curves in the same manner we can develop pm1 m2 interaction curve for shear walls also and we can use it there is no problem till this point problem is when we have a beam connected to the shear wall in the perpendicular direction like i have shown so there may be the beams connected in the plane of the shear wall this ho these horizontal beams these are connected in the plane of the shear wall and these will be subjected to moment and these will also be subjected to yielding so these beams or reinforcement of these beams may be continued throughout the shear wall or may be anchored depending upon the thickness of the shear wall if the dimension of the the width of the beam is larger than the thickness or width of the shear wall then uh, we may continue this horizontal element it does not affect uh, the shear wall so we can continue it like this and uh, outer plane beam we can connect with it but the problem is when this outer plane beam is going to yield it will be subjected to frame action and it will it is going to yield here or it may cause yielding of the shear wall and somebody also asked that how we are going to take care of the anchorage of the beam reinforcement into the shear wall or the beam reinforcement passing through the shear wall because that 20 times diameter dimension has to be applied here as well and we have to ensure that the shear wall should not yield it, it, the yielding should occur in the frame the out of plane yielding in shear wall is uh, to be avoided so in that case although it is not given in any book i have not seen anywhere or what comes to my mind and what i have discussed with some of the practicing friends we can provide a vertical element here a vertical column like element so this type of element can be provided anywhere in the shear wall we can provide at the ends uh, there was also one question in the beginning of today's talk that if the shear wall is connected it is attached to two columns on the boundaries then how to design it so if a column is here or the column is at the boundaries that once integrated with the shear wall it becomes part of the shear wall and the whole cross section is to be used for in plane but for out of plane we should design this column in such a way as we would have been designing it in this frame so if it is in the center of the wall we can understand that it is not going to contribute much in the in plane bending moment because it is close to neutral axis not at the neutral axis but close to neutral axis so its contribution is going to be less but in outer plane it, it is it is uh, only it is uh, supporting or it is registering the bending moment which is coming from the beam so this type of arrangement perhaps till the codes come out with uh, specific guidelines we can continue with uh, this type of uh, arrangement if the beams are being connected to the walls in outer plane direction usually it should be avoided as far as possible the beam should not be connected to the shear wall in outer plane direction the beam should be connected to the shear walls in in plane direction but if it is to be connected it should be connected either at the boundary element where the boundary element will act like a column or if it is connected in the middle then we should provide a column like element within the shear wall okay now let's see the coupled shear wall because in uh, most of our taller buildings we will be using uh, coupled shear walls 
there may be a shear wall core and the openings are arranged in vertical direction so the vertical shear this sorry this coupled shear wall works on this principle that suppose i have two shear walls in a uh, building then the um, effective moment of inertia is two times the moment of inertia of each wall and uh, i am going to get as 1 by 6 of tb cube because two times tb cube by crack if i combine these two walls if i integrate these two uh, walls together so that the shear reinforcement is uh, continuous then this will become as if it is having a length of 2b and in that case this moment of inertia will be 4 by 6 of tb cube this is much larger we can see it is much larger than this so it was 1 by 6 it is 4 by 6 so this is having four times larger capacity than this both in stiffness as well as in strength now in third possibility i am not connecting them fully but i am connecting intermittently using these coupling beams so there the effective moment of inertia will be somewhere in between depending on the stiffness and strength of these coupling beams and as we have seen uh, if it if these are to be defined as shear walls the strength of the and stiffness of the coupling beams is much smaller than uh, the shear walls so the coupling beams are going to yield before the shear walls yield at the base and as the coupling beams are yielding these have larger energy dissipation so these coupling beams help not only in increasing the strength because these are coupling the two walls so the strength and stiffness is increasing not only that because of their yielding they are also enhancing the energy dissipation so the ductility or energy dissipation also increases that's why you see the response reduction factor in case of coupled shear walls is higher as compared to the cantilever shear walls the reason for that is the additional energy dissipation which we are getting from these coupling beams so these coupling beams are focus of our design here how what are the ways and lot of research has been done on these coupling beams how we should design what are the different possibilities only some glimpses of that i am going to give you here so these coupling beams when the, the shear wall tries to deform these coupling beams will be subjected to large shear force as i have shown here and if i take a coupled shear wall like this what uh, you see that it can be represented by uh, a frame or two shear walls represented by a wide column these vertical columns and these are interconnected by uh, these beams and the nodes the joints where these are connected you can see these are in the middle of the shear wall so here we are um, uh, modeling the length of this beam larger than what actually it is because this portion of the beam which is inside the shear wall that is not going to deform so this portion which is equal to the width of the shear wall that will remain as rigid because here uh, plane sections almost remain plane because it is a deeper beam so euler bernoulli hypothesis is not exactly valid so plane section do not remain exactly plane there will be some distortion but practically we can assume those to remain plane and this will act like a very rigid beam similarly on the right hand side also it will act like a very rigid beam and only this portion which is in the middle that is going to deform and this section which was plane and perpendicular to the neutral axis will remain plane and perpendicular to the neutral axis here similarly this one and this portion of the beam the clear length of the beam that will be subjected to very large deformation and as a result it will be subjected to large shear force and bending moment and this has been observed in uh, earthquakes also so what we see here most of the damage will occur here at the junction and within the coupling beams and once these coupling beams yield then the shear walls will yield here and as a result the shear walls are going to crack here so first the coupling beams are going to yield and these coupling beams will be dissipating lot of energy so when we are designing coupled shear walls the mode of resistance of lateral force there are two modes 
And these are all not only coupling the two shear walls, these are also coupling two modes. And what are those two modes of coupling? The frame mode and the shear wall mode. What is the difference between a frame mode and a shear wall mode? The frame mode is arising because of the rigid connection between beam and columns. And due to that, we have what we call a shear beam mode. And we have uh, a flexure mode, uh, which is occurring like a cantilever, panning of a cantilever. And in case of coupled shear walls, these two modes are coupled. And this we can understand like this, that because of the shear force, which is developing in these uh, coupling beams, there will be compression in wall two and there will be tension one. And due to that, this uh, tension and compression, a couple will develop and that couple is going to uh, balance the overturning moment here. So whatever overturning moment is occurring because of the later load, that will be balanced by two actions. One action is this overturning, which is due to frame action and which is arising from these coupling beams. And it depends upon the capacity of these coupling beams. And the other mode that is occurring because of the uh, bending of these shear walls, like a cantilever. And due to that, there is a moment M1 here and M2 here. And out of this total moment, total overturning moment, which is applied due to this load, whatever moment is registered by this overturning, that ratio we call coupling ratio. So this coupling ratio is nothing but the moment registered by the shear force in all the coupling beams multiplied by this lever arm center to center of these walls. So L times summation of this shear force in the beam divided by the total moment total overturning moment, which we can obtain either by summing up M1, M2, and this moment, or we can also obtain it from the applied load because applied load is causing that total moment. And this ratio of the two, we call coupling ratio. And this is an important ratio. And if coupling ratio is zero, that means there is no coupling. And if coupling ratio is one, that means the two shear walls are acting as one. So coupling ratio of one, 100% coupling, can be achieved only when these shear walls are uh, um, integrated together. The horizontal reinforcement is made continuous. So if the two shear walls are together, then only we can achieve this coupling ratio as one. How this coupling ratio actually varies within a, um, a coupled shear wall, we can see from here. If we take only the individual wall, so individual wall response will be what is given by the bottom figure. If we take a coupling beam response, it is something like this. And the overall response is something like this. So in overall response, you can see there are two yield points here. So first yielding is representing yielding of coupling beams. And ideal situation, although it is not possible, ideal situation will be when all the coupling beams are yielding together. But because the bending moment uh, changes along the height, the shear force in the coupling beams changes along the height, it may not be possible to ideally achieve this, but most of the coupling beams will yield here. And then at the second point, it is the yielding of the wall. So when the wall also yields, then the whole system yields. And as a result, we get good energy dissipation. I will skip this. So this is the variation of the coupling ratio. So till the beams are yielding, the coupling ratio is increasing. More and more load is uh, being transferred by a overturning uh, by a, this uh, frame action. But once the yielding occurs, yielding of the coupling beam occurs, the coupling ratio increases. And once the shear walls also yield at the base, why it is decreasing? It is decreasing because the beams have yielded. So uh, their stiffness has reduced, but the shear walls have not yet yielded. So this coupling ratio is going to reduce. Once the shear wall also yield, then the coupling ratio becomes constant or increases a little bit. Now, three types of coupling beams are common. I will discuss those. One is the conventional reinforcement and that uh, conventional reinforcement um, where the reinforcement is similar to what we are providing in our conventional beams, except that uh, being a deep beam, we have to provide some face reinforcement or skin reinforcement in the middle also here. And we do the confinement. And it depends upon the aspect ratio of this beam. 
So if LB by HB is greater than four, then we can do the conventional. LB is the span and HB is the depth of this coupling beam. So if that is less than four, sorry, LB by HB is greater than four, that means it is a slender coupling beam. In that case, we can go for couple uh, conventional uh, reinforcement. And uh, during a seismic event, due to reversal, it will be subjected to cracking like this, and it will be uh, transferring forces, moments between the boundary elements. But if LB by HB is less than two, that means it is a very deep beam, spandrel, or uh, a very short uh, coupling beam, then we have to provide diagonal reinforcement. This provision is there in our code also, and uh, that's related with the shear force also. How or in which condition we should go for conventionally reinforced beam, and in which condition we should go for uh, diagonally reinforced beam, this I have taken from Mohile's book, and here both are important. The length to depth ratio, the aspect ratio of the beam, which is given here, and also the shear force. So BU by ACW square root FC dash, this is representing the normalized shear force. So normalized shear force and the aspect ratio both decide. If the is more than four, then it is conventionally reinforced beam in any case. If aspect ratio is less than two and the shear force ratio, the normalized shear force, that is also greater than um, 0.4 to 4, so it's somewhere close to 0.3, more than 0.3, so if it is here, so then it will be diagonally reinforced. So in this range, in this region, we have to provide diagonally reinforced. If it is very, very short uh, beam, less than 0.5, then this diagonal reinforcement or uh, conventional reinforcement will not work. The design has to be done as using strut and tie model. And in the top portion, when the shear force is very, very large, the coupling beam uh, will not be possible. So more than 0.6, this ratio, more than 0.6 should not be really used. Even if we are using uh, uh, diagonally reinforced um, beam, usually, uh, we get this impression, especially from our code, that with diagonally reinforced, uh, uh, with diagonal reinforcement, we can go for any shear force in the coupling beams, but that's not true. So there has to be an upper limit on this also, somewhere close to 0.7. So uh, we, we should have a look at that also. Okay, and uh, our code also provides this expression that how we can calculate the reinforcement. The reinforcement is calculated, the diagonal reinforcement is calculated in such a way uh, that the whole of the shear force is taken care of by the diagonal reinforcement because the concrete will get crushed. Concrete is uh, not going to participate in the resistance. So whole force, the whole component of the force, vertical component of the force is to be taken care of by this uh, reinforcement. And the horizontal component of the force in the reinforcement, that will take care of the moment. So we have to calculate moment also uh, like this. So this reinforcement should be adequate to take care of the shear force and the corresponding moment we can calculate from here. Now, what is important is the confinement of this diagonal reinforcement. So this diagonal reinforcement has to be specially confined. And uh, the requirement for this confinement is given in the code. And then it has to be developed into the shear wall. So it should go sufficiently inside into the shear wall in such a way that the uh, full development length. In fact, our code says 1.25 times the development length should be provided inside. Now, problem is faced in providing this type of reinforcement and that too it is also covered by the conventional reinforcement outside. So in uh, ACI 318, two options are there. One option is that we can confine this bundle, diagonal bundle of reinforcement like this. Alternatively, we may not confine this diagonal bundle, but we can confine the full beam, full coupling beam. So this reinforcement will be calculated as required by the code, but that rather than confining this bundle, we are confining the whole reinforcement. So you can see here, stirrups are not provided here. And stirrups are provided in the full 
uh, beam, full coupling beam, and it gives better constructibility. I could get two photographs also from somewhere. So in one photograph, it is shown how uh, the bundle is to be uh, confined and these two bundles are crossing each other. So the constructibility becomes difficult. Placing of reinforcement and concreting also becomes difficult. Alternative to the, this is that the reinforcement is provided diagonally, but the confinement is done in the coupling beam. So here the coupling beam itself is confined. In that case, confining of this bundle is not needed. The third or very common type of uh, construction nowadays is providing steel uh, coupling beams because if the shear force is very large, we cannot uh, take care of that even using uh, coupling reinforcement, sorry, using diagonal reinforcement. So in that case, we have to go for uh, steel coupling beams and these steel coupling beams, uh, you will be, uh, you may be knowing uh, that steel actually is even more ductile in shear. So if we are using a <coughs> coupling beam, a short coupling beam in steel, which is yielding in shear, we will get very good ductility. So uh, using the purpose of using these uh, uh, coupling beams in steel is that we will get uh, good ductility and we will get good shear resistance also. And uh, we will be able to achieve good uh, coupling ratio. So, um, this design can be done in the typical manner as we do for uh, steel. Uh, it is something similar to a link in an eccentrically braced frame. So AISC code provides uh, details for that. Our steel code does not provide that at the moment, but uh, we can refer to AISC code. AISC provides the detailing of this uh, link in the eccentrically braced frames. And the same design and detailing we can use here. What is crucial here is its embedment, its anchorage into the concrete walls. So this is the zone on which I want to focus. So here you can see openings have been shown in the bell so that the reinforcement can be provided, the ties can be provided through the bell so that this portion is confined. So detailing of this portion and the calculation of length of embedment into the shear wall. That is a crucial issue. So it is a photograph where uh, this is shown how, how these are placed in a real building. These, this is an additional uh, type of uh, shear coupling beam where a portion of the coupling beam is intentionally provided as weaker. So if we, uh, we, uh, we make this uh, portion weaker, then the yielding is going to occur here and this will get damaged during earthquake. And once it gets damaged, suppose the damage is accessible, we can just remove it and replace this. So it acts as a sacrificial fuse. So we can sacrifice this during earthquake and energy will be dissipated. So we can have this type of arrangement also. In both the cases, whether it is uh, fuse or uh, the full uh, uh, beam, we need to design the confinement. Okay, I will come back to this. So this uh, anchorage length LE needs to be calculated. And this LE is calculated like this. This is the half portion of the coupling beam on, which is embedded into one side uh, coupling, uh, one side shear wall. So one of the coupled shear wall, it is embedded. And uh, at the center, there will be a point of contour fracture. So I can assume that the shear force is acting at this location. And when the shear force is acting here, we can see that in this portion, there will be compression. Uh, on the bottom face and here the compression will be on the top face. And the variation of the strain is going to be like this. So we can using the same stress strain curve, same method as we are using in our concrete design, we, we can calculate the moment of resistance of this. And that moment of resistance should be equal to this VU into GY2. So we can do a little mathematics, a little substitution and uh, for embedment, uh, in, it's, it's, it's still not there in the codes, but this uh, paper by al -Tawil, that that is considered to be uh, the basic paper on this. And this embedment length can be calculated like this. So more details you can find. If you are interested in designing this, you can find here. But uh, keep in mind that this effective, this anchorage length needs to be designed. This, this should be designed properly. 
this needs to be calculated then another issue is uh, how to proportion a coupled shear wall what size and strength of the uh, beams and shear wall i should take so uh, in reality actually the strength of the uh, or the required strength or applied bending moment in the coupled uh, in, in the coupling beams will change along the height so uh, some of the codes like the canadian code and i think also the euro code i am not very sure uh, so they these codes permit 20% redistribution what does that mean that the actual demand on the coupling beams may be like this so it will not be uniform what we can do to make the design simpler i can design all the coupling beams at the same strength such that the difference is not more than 20% so if this difference is within 20% i can do that now in some cases the variation may be too much because if it is a tall building the variation may be so large that it may not be possible to provide one reinforcement uh, or one uh, design which will be within 20% so in that case what we are doing uh, we may provide two or multiple uh, sets of um, coupling beams with equal strength in such a way that the strength uh, the difference between the provided strength and the demand is not more than 20% so if uh, that much difference is there and the total strength provided the total shear force provided by these uh, beams together should be same as the demand which we are getting from this curve so the total demand should be same as the total capacity and nowhere the capacity should be more than 20% different from the demand so that eases out the design so this we can utilize for example uh, they have given uh, this example also that if it is a low rise buildings we can have just one set of the coupling beams if it is a tall building we may have four types uh, of walls and five types of uh, coupling beams so the ratio of the coupling beam stiffness to the shear wall stiffness may change along the height and we can choose the different segments of the height in such a way that there we are providing a uniform design of uh, coupling beams so that simplifies our design of coupled shear walls this i discussed this is the detailing of the steel uh, coupling beam we use what we call uh, transfer bars here so these transfer bars can also be used i think i have already taken a lot of time and a lot of things are still remaining so i will quickly go through i will skip this also you can see it is self explanatory you can see i will skip this what i want to discuss was uh, the design of foundations because that is critical so when we are designing the foundations of shear walls uh, shear walls are uh, mobilizing lot of moment at the base and that moment is to be registered by the foundation foundation alone with its own um, uh, weight it cannot register the moment which is coming from the shear wall so it needs the counter weight from the columns so the column weight should flow here like this which will register which will help the foundation registering this moment so isolated footing for a shear wall is not going to work it has to be a combined footing so this footing should be combined that is one thing and these footing should combine adequate number of uh, columns so that adequate amount of gravity load is there which is preventing overturning of, of the foundation then when we have uh, a basement li like the one here then in case of basement this back stay fact is there and uh, the, due to this back stay fact the uh, moment at the base of the shear wall is registered by this couple so what this couple is doing it is uh, applying a support this is providing a support at the back stay level and then the another force is coming from the foundation and this portion of the shear wall which is between the back stay and the foundation this will be subjected to very large shear i will explain this in further slides so this portion which we are having here this is called panel zone 
similar to the beam column joint. We have a panel zone in the beam column joint, and that panel zone is uh, subjected to very large shear force. So this portion is also subjected to shear force, large shear force. Sometimes we can also have an outrigger. You are familiar with the outrigger at the top uh, in some stories at a higher level, which mobilizes uh, the column forces to enhance the efficiency of the shear wall. In the same manner, the outrigger can be provided at the base also. Because here also, we have to mobilize the capacity from the columns. So we can provide a, an outrigger. Outrigger, nothing but another horizontal shear wall. So this portion, which is the junction of the shear wall with the outrigger, this portion is subjected to very large shear force. And we should take care here. Here we need to design it properly because it is going to be subjected to very large shear force, which may not be predicted by usual modeling and analysis. Similarly, when it is a coupled shear wall, then in, and uh, at the you know, foundation, it is solid. So this portion of the shear wall, where, which is below these openings, so this portion is also subjected to very large uh, shear force. We have to design this also properly. I um, discussed that when there is a um, backstay, I have uh, a basement at the top of the basement. Uh, it will be subjected to very large, the diaphragm will be subjected to large forces. And as a result, this portion of the shear wall will be subjected to large shear. Why large shear? That we can see from here. This is the boundary element of the shear wall. On one end, in the boundary element, I will get tension. And on the other element, other boundary element, I will get compression. So it is subjected to horizontal force because of this slab. It is subjected to vertical direction also, it is subjected to shear force. So we can see that this panel, which is in between, this will be subjected to large shear stresses. So we are getting shear stress from here. We are getting shear stress from here. And the shear stresses here are to be obtained considering the forces in these boundary elements also. So if you are doing a finite element model, where you are doing a meshing, you will be able to obtain the shear force. But if you are doing, uh, let us say, wide column method or some other modeling, then you will not be able to estimate the shear force directly from your analysis. So be careful that this shear force is estimated correctly. And uh, this reinforcement, uh, of course, for shear, we have to provide reinforcement again in form of a grid, horizontal and vertical reinforcement. But this reinforcement should be adequate to take care of this shear force. In this case, when we have uh, a uh, outrigger and outrigger, the reinforcement will be concentrated at the top in the outrigger, the reinforcement will be concentrated at the bottom. Along the boundaries of the shear wall, we have these boundary element reinforcement running. And in between, this is the panel element. And this panel element is to be subjected to uh, large forces. And we have to provide uh, adequate reinforcement. And this reinforcement can be obtained using a strut and tie model also. Uh, we can do the conventional analysis, but alternatively, we can use the strut and tie model also. And we have to ensure that this concrete strut, which we are getting here, that should also not fail. We can go on increasing the reinforcement, but if the concrete itself fails, that means the shear stress should not exceed tau C max, what is given in our code. Because if the shear stress is exceeding tau C max, then the concrete diagonal is going to fail. And... Uh, then whatever amount of reinforcement we are providing, that will not be able to design that. If that type of situation is occurring, we have to provide other forms of reinforcement. We have to provide reinforcement in the diagonal direction also. The common error which uh, has been exposed in uh, one of the past earthquakes, I think Loma Pita most probably, if I remember correctly, this happened, that the portion of basement shear wall below the coupled shear wall, below the opening, this portion got damaged. And the reason for that was that this inside boundary element, here the opening is finishing. So the reinforcement was anchored to a length of LD and it was left here. And as a result, a lot of damage occurred here. And this damage was because of this panel zone behavior of this portion. So in this panel zone, what actually has to be done that the reinforcement should go below this panel zone. So this, this, should, this should go down 
into the panel zone and then we will be able to define we will be able to design this if it is left here then what is going to happen this panel zone uh, transfer is not complete and as a result the damage will occur here so it is important it is necessary that the reinforcement in the boundary element should go down uh, right up to the lower uh, the inside uh, reinforcement also even if the openings are not there it should go down uh, quite deep so that it can transfer the forces to the panel zone then if we are having a core and in core we have flanges connected with the, the bear then uh, we have to understand how the force from the flanges gets transferred to the foundation so the force from the flanges do not get transferred to the foundation directly like this rather it flows through the bear so whatever compressive force is occurring here let us say that will flow to the webs so this is the bear this is the flange so it will go to the bear and bear is subjected to its own shear force also in its own plane so there is shear force occurring from the flange there is shear force occurring because of the bear due to its own shear and as a result this will also be subjected to very large shear forces this is panel zone and this panel zone should be properly designed uh, the reinforcement should be adequate and uh, the shear stress should be properly calculated now uh, diaphragm i will skip because diaphragm is not yet covered in our uh, code but uh, in case of shear walls what i want to highlight is that the diaphragm also is important especially when it is at the back stay level so at the back stay level here and here the diaphragm will be subjected to very large stresses because it is uh, supporting the shear wall so whatever lateral force the shear wall is accumulating from the top that is to be transferred by this couple so you can see here by these couples if if it was having only this much uh, basement only then it will be transferred by this couple and as a result our podium wall sorry uh, our podium back stay the top of the podium uh, slab diaphragm is subjected to large forces and for those large forces we should have some distributor reinforcement and uh, we can see that this strip which is in which this reinforcement is provided and suppose the force is acting in the shear wall towards right so this portion will be subjected to compression whereas this portion will be subjected to tension so especially in tension portion because concrete cannot take tension we need adequate reinforcement so this should be provided adequate reinforcement which will be take care of this force which is uh, getting accumulated in this uh, shear wall then i want to spend some time on the modeling so both types of models are available for uh, shear walls we use a skeletal model as well as continuum model a skeletal model or the frame elements these are consisting of elements uh, which have distribution of mass in one line so these elements can be represented by line so sometimes these are also called linear elements linear in the sense that these can be represented by line linear not in the sense of material nonlinearity or the structural nonlinearity these are linear in the sense that uh, these are represented by lines for example beams columns and shear walls can be represented as column also shear walls can be modeled as columns also that's why you can see the shear wall is appearing here also but in reality shear wall is a continuum because it is having distribution of mass in two directions in a plane so this continuum model which is uh, which cannot be represented by a line actually it is represented by the area it the different types of finite elements are available to model these area elements if you are not interested in outer plane forces then you can model a shear wall using a plane stress element itself if you are interested in uh, uh, in plane bending also and outer plane bending also you can model these using shell elements so shell element will take care of the in plane as well as outer plane and finally any structure can be considered as a 3d continuum 
and we can use brick elements, whether it is a shear wall or for that matter, even if it is a, a beam or column, we can divide it into a smaller solid elements. Although the number of elements in that case is going to be very large and uh, the analysis is going to be very difficult. So we will need a large computer to solve even a moderate size shear wall. So mostly these two, the continuum using uh, plate, uh, sorry, using shell or uh, plane stress elements. In case of a stat, they call it as plate element, but actually it is not plate. It is uh, uh, shell element because it is considering in plane as well as out of plane actions. So, or we can model shear walls using frame elements where uh, the shear walls are modeled using columns and the coupling beams are modeled using beams. Uh, this we have discussed, I think, earlier uh, discussions also. Uh, any skeletal element is represented by this model with six degrees of freedom at each node. And uh, every element, whether it is a skeletal or continuum, is finally represented by this stress matrix. Only the method of estimating this matrix is different, but finally, the program recognizes each element by a matrix like this. So the software recognizes each element by a matrix, something similar to this. So when we are modeling the shear wall using uh, a frame element, we have to be careful that, that uh, shear deformations cannot be ignored. And uh, the Bernoulli hypothesis is not exactly uh, valid. We have to use Timoshenko beam theory. So the Euler beam theory will not work. Euler Bernoulli hypothesis will not work. So some modification in the stress matrix is required. And uh, most of the software are now having um, uh, frame elements based on Timoshenko beam theory. But uh, please make sure when you are using a wide column that uh, otherwise it will uh, uh, model the frame stiffer than actual. So due to the shear deformations, the stiffness is going to reduce. Then I already discussed that the, in case of shear walls, this finite size of the joints is important. This should be modeled. Either we can model it using offset command or we can just increase the stiffness of the beam in this portion, which is half width of the shear wall on each end. So that much we can increase. Using offset command is better as compared to increasing the stiffness. The reason is that when we are increasing the stiffness, we are combining very rigid elements with flexible elements. And uh, it may lead to some numerical problems in the solution. So if we are using offset command or uh, the geometric constraints, then we are using some matrices and uh, there uh, this numerical instability can be avoided. So this is a typical model for a coupled shear wall where each shear wall is represented by a column. Then beam is represented by a beam element and or frame element and the common portion is represented by rigid elements or offsets. Then one important issue is that what effective stiffness of the shear walls and the coupling beams we should consider. So different options or different uh, recommendations are there what I want to discuss with you is that uh, ACI 318, Euro code and our code. So ACI 318 uh, suggests that in case of coupling beams as well as coupled shear walls, the in-plane stiffness, we can use 0.35. Okay, so flexural stiffness, we should use 0.35 EIG. And uh, uh, if it is uncracked wall, then it can be used as 0.7. 70% of the gross section. But usually this will not be the case. Most of the cases we will be having the cracked shear wall, at least in the bottom portion. And the overall behavior is governed by the uh, stiffness in the bottom. So we should use 0.35 EIG. And uh, in case of coupling beams also, it is 0.35 EIG. The shear stiffness is uh, full. The gross stiffness is used for uh, shear. In Euro code, we, it is suggested to uh, use 50% of the uncracked uh, elements for both flexure and shear. So both flexure and shear stiffnesses are reduced to 50%. Here, the flexural stiffness is reduced to 35%, but there is no reduction in the shear. 
So both will reach somewhere close. Now, in outer plane, I could not find uh, much literature, but I could locate in this uh, tall building initiative, TBI document, uh, it is given for outer plane uh, and uh, that outer plane is here. So structural walls, these are actually shear walls. In outer plane, we have to consider 25% of the gross stiffness. Okay, as I said that in case of outer plane action, not only the stiffness is smaller, the effect of cracking is also more because the core thickness uh, as compared to uh, the overall thickness is less. So uh, here, the effect of cracking is more. So only 25% we consider in outer plane. So this will give us reasonable amount of uh, outer plane moments in our shear walls and that we can use for uh, in plane outer plane uh, interaction. And same is in case of basement walls. Uh, basement walls act as retaining walls also because these are acting as shear walls. So these are uh, resisting forces in their in plane. And in outer plane, these are resisting the soil. So for that also, we need the outer plane uh, stiffness. And there also, it can be treated as 0.25%. Then uh, if we are using, let us say, a plain stress element to model uh, the shear wall and the beams are connected to it. So this type of situation is there. Then in plain stress element, there is no uh, rotational degree of freedom here. And if we have to connect uh, the beam to the plain stress element, then it will uh, become, uh, it will be incompatible. There is no degree of freedom corresponding to the rotational degree of freedom. And as a result, a hinge will be considered here. It, it will act like a hinge here. So to prevent that, what we can do, sometimes we add fictitious beams here. So these beams are fictitious. These are not there in the real structure. These are there only in the model. And these are rigid. These are connected at the ends only. And then the beams can be connected to this. The purpose of providing these fictitious beams is that the actual beam, which is here, is able to be connected to this. Now here we have uh, typical uh, models using equivalent frame method. Left side is the frame method and right side is the finite element method for a U-shaped shear wall. So the shape of the shear wall is like this. So when we are modeling it using finite element, then there is not much problem. We can model this using shell element. Uh, it should be sufficiently refined mesh and we can model any shape here, whatever uh, is the connection, we can, we can model like this. But when we have to model the same using a frame element, wide column, then there are two possibilities. One possibility is that whole of this shear wall we represent by a single column. And that column we assign at the centroid of this geometry, centroid of this U shape, we provide it here. So that is one model, but we can have a uh, better frame model also, where each of the flange and the bab is modeled by separate frame elements, but these are to be interconnected. So how these are interconnected? These are interconnected using these stiff elements. And uh, what is the size of these stiff elements? The size of these stiff element is half because the column is provided at the center. So half width of the bab and the flange is interconnected. And then these are connected here. So the bab is connected with the flange at the corner. So at the corners, we are, we are connecting these. And these are representing the half width. So this column at, is at the center of this bab, sorry, this flange. This column is at the center of this bab. And this column is at the center of this flange. And these are interconnected through rigid elements. So that is a typical equivalent frame model for a non-planar shear wall. Uh, we can use the full shear wall also as a planar element or a single element. So here, uh, these two U-shaped shear walls, these are coupled using these coupling beams. So coupling beams are to be modeled separately. But this whole of this U-shear wall, that's, that can be represented by one column. So here, this full shear wall, U-shaped shear wall, or half portion of this whole shear wall is represented by one column at the centroid of this U. And similarly, this 
uh, u is represented by another column at the centroid of that u. And the clear gap here, this is represented, the clear length of the coupling beam, this is represented by the actual beam. And uh, rest of the portion is represented by rigid connections, rigid members. So this type of model also we can use. Here, the coupled shear wall is modeled using finite element. So where the shear wall portion is modeled using shell element, but the beams are modeled using beam elements. And keep in mind here, this portion, you see some shaded, it is not very clear. So when you are connecting a beam to a finite element, then the, even if it is having rotational degree of freedom, it will be connected at one point, one node, one point. And if you are connecting the whole beam, coupling beam, which is registering such large force at one point, that point is going to yield. So what we do, we connect it rigidly with the adjacent nodes also. So what you see here, this uh, nine, uh, three by three elements, these nine joints have been connected to this end of the uh, beam so that it involves a larger area of the uh, shear wall. Otherwise, if you are connecting it with single point, then that portion is going to yield, that portion is going to deform, and uh, the rigidity of the uh, connection will not be simulated. Then, uh, in case of design, there was one question that when we are designing, how we should define uh, the peers. So, if it is a shear wall, let us say, of this irregular shape, sometimes what people do, they divide the baths and the flanges as separate peers. That is not correct. We should not do that. The peers are to be defined, as I said in the beginning of today's discussion, the peers are defined by the physical boundaries. So if those are separated physically, then you can define them as uh, separate peers. Otherwise, those should be defined as one single peer, and it should be designed as one full section because the portion which will be in compression will be small. Now, uh, you can argue it this way also that uh, we have uh, analyzed it using uh, um, the actual section, but only in design, we are separating for the purpose of reinforcement calculation, we are separating and whatever we will get that reinforcement we may provide. Sometimes people argue that, but keep in mind the calculation of the forces in a uh, shear wall is based on usually what we are doing is based on linear analysis. Linear analysis means that the distribution of the stress in the cross section is linear in analysis. But while designing, we are using limited state method or ultimate load method where the distribution of stress is not linear. So what we will get from the distribution of stress, we will get from linear analysis. Same we will not get at the time of design. So when we have these uh, shear walls of uh, uh, orthogonal panels connected together, U-shape, C-shape, L-shape, T-shape, the whole of the shear wall, until unless it is divided by some opening, it has to be considered as one peer. And that's how the reinforcement should be obtained. Thank you. That's what I had planned to discuss. And I'm happy that most of the things I could cover today within the time. But let's see if uh, we have time and we can take up some questions. So I'm stopped with sharing. Thank you. Yeah. There are questions in question and session, question and answer session. That 72 okay. questions are there. We All can right. take some and our balance we can answer. Yeah. As so as one thing we are doing is that all these questions, mm -hmm. like in the previous lecture, yeah. we are collecting together and doing. So let me start from the beginning first. Okay, so I think this question I have answered. So about the length of the boundary zones, how to identify critical sections, uh, how uh, we should assign the peers, these I have answered. This question is not clear to me how uh, we design. So I request uh, Mr. Srinivas Reddy to write to me in more detail because it is not clear what exactly you want to ask. 
in STAD, how it should be modeled, not very clear to me. Efficiency of C-shaped and I-shaped shear walls, I discussed. Um, C-shaped and I-shaped shear walls are more efficient because of the flange action. So we should prefer that. And uh, moreover, those are uh, those um, elements are also providing uh, support to the orthogonal components. So that is better, but we should be uh, providing adequate confinement at the required location. Mr. Sreshtra is asking something. Should we continue beam element inside the shear wall or not? Okay, if required, we can continue the, as I have shown, we can continue the beam uh, element inside the shear wall, but if the shear wall is uh, adequately thick, then we may not. So it's the choice of the designer. Both ways we can do it. Uh, providing a beam in the shear wall does not affect its behavior. It will provide some additional confinement. That's it. Okay, books and references. This is important. So uh, there is uh, one reference which I can share with you people. It is uh, NIST design brief. Uh, many of you might have seen earlier. I can discuss this. And the book which I could uh, get is by Mohile. So Mohile has recently published a book on uh, RCC design, seismic design of RCC buildings. That book is, I, I found quite useful. So you may also go through that. And uh, most of the things you will find uh, many things in this presentation also, I have borrowed from there. Uh, what is the minimum bearing capacity of the soil required to go for shear wall? Actually, it is not related with the bearing capacity. As long as you can design the foundation without uplift, you can go for it. What is, will be the effect of how uh, high, low shear force in shear wall and how to account for it? Uh, well, whether it is high shear force or low shear force, we have to design for it. And uh, in design, we have to check for both the reinforcement as well as tau C max. It should not exceed tau C max in any case. Can we access the previous webinars yeah. if it is recorded? Um, Mr. Parulekar, I have no problem. Yeah. But yeah. It, it is only a matter of uh, facilitating. So yeah. Mr. Parulekar- uh, That can be done. Uh, you can send a mail to us. We'll yeah. send it. Yeah, yeah, we have all the recordings. There is confusion regarding length of boundary element. Yes, we covered that. How to consider the effective length of shear wall for outer plane? Yes. So outer plane bending moment I talked and uh, uh, the effective length, we have some guidance available in, in ACI 318. So depending on how it is connected to the top and bottom uh, floats, we can get the, over, the effective length factor. So that we can refer to ACI 318. Why Indian, US and Euro courts are using different stiffness modification factors. So it is not only the stiffness modification factors, many things are different. And uh, that depends upon the history, how uh, these courts have evolved. So, uh, because the things, but uh, you will find that the consensus is building up. Many things which earlier were different in Euro code and uh, American code, I find that they are converging. So in future, we expect a convergence, but uh, till our understanding, we have a consensus in our understanding, this difference will be there. So we have to live with this. And while working in a country, we have to follow uh, that code because some of the people are saying that in Euro code, it is giving lower. Uh, but nobody so far has asked me that euro code is giving higher why don't you provide higher <laughs> everybody asked that euro code is giving lower why don't you uh, can we provide lower so don't provide lower but wherever it is giving higher you are welcome to do that so do not uh, flout the code of any country in which you are working but if you want to improve beyond that then it is welcome but you cannot provide anything less than what is demanded in that country. Okay, flanges in H shape wall we discussed. 
Okay, how do we calculate axial force on boundary elements in shear walls? Okay, so this calculation, this method of designing boundary walls was approximate. This was there in our earlier code. Now we do not design the boundary elements separately and uh, the web portion separately. That type of design we do not do. We design the whole section of the shear wall for the total bending moment, total axial force and total shear force. So the full section should be designed. And uh, now uh, tools are available. You can use section designer or section modeler where you can define the full number of tools are there. You can use, you can design any shape. I, because if somebody is writing a question, then my cursor goes right below oh, and then okay. I forget <laughs> where, where I was looking at. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes it is observed that connecting piece beam between shear wall becomes difficult to follow 1920 recommendation. How to deal, how to detail this beam? You have to follow 1920 and uh, you have to find out some way. Okay, if you give uh, exact situation, then we can think of. But uh, what is given in IS 13920 has some requirement, has some basis behind it. So that we have to follow. How to model shear wall attached to columns, this I discussed. If the shear wall is attached to columns at the two ends, then those columns will become part of the shear wall and whole section will be designed as one using the section model, section design. ETFs automatically, automatically calculate lengths of the boundary element. This seems not in line with IS 13920. How to solve this problem? So one problem solution, all structural engineers know from the beginning that whenever there is a doubt, when you have got two answers, you go for the conservative one. So. If, if you are getting two answers for the same problem and you are not sure which one is correct, take whichever is the most conservative. How to design reinforcement for shear force near the opening? Okay, so near the opening, uh, there are two portions. One is the pier and another is the uh, spandrel. So both pier and spandrel are to be designed for the shear force, whichever is coming there. And uh, up here, we are providing a horizontal and vertical reinforcement. In a spandrel, depending on H by B ratio, you can provide either uh, a diagonal reinforcement or you can provide conventional reinforcement. Do we need to design shear wall D by B greater than four for minimum eccentricity if it behaves as a column as per the bending moment diagram? Yes, uh, if it is a column. In fact, shear wall is also to be designed for minimum eccentricity. In in-plane direction, the minimum eccentricity may not have much effect because the dimension is large. But in outer plane, it has a very significant effect. So even the shear wall is to be designed for minimum eccentricity because minimum eccentricity is from the construction point of view. So for the misalignment, so that we have to use. In ETFs, is it permitted to use the stiffness factor as 0.35 for beam and same beam by using 0.49 for design? I could not get this. So anonymous attendee, please uh, explain me uh, this question in more detail. I'm not able to understand what is this 0.49? Discontinued shear wall in height. Yes, this I forgot. In fact, I have thought of talking about this. I'm happy that you asked it. Discontinuity can be in two ways. One discontinuity is in the lower portion that the wall is discontinued at a particular height below. So the wall is not continuing below a particular height. That type of discontinuity is not allowed. That should not be done. Until unless a very sophisticated design of a transfer story is done. We have a very deep, uh, what we call outrigger. If we have that type of arrangement, which is difficult to design, we should not discontinue the shear wall below a level. Discontinuity above a height is also considered as irregularity. 
but it is not that severe problem as the other one so if we are having we are discontinuing uh, shear wall at a height we are not going we are not providing above a height then in that case the columns which are supported on the shear wall those columns need to be uh, especially confined throughout the column height throughout the story height and also ld into the shear wall so that type of detailing is to be can we avoid response spectrum analysis use first mode analysis only people <coughs> are using these additional dynamic effects yes we can do that okay please elaborate intensity ratio that is not possible at the moment we will explain it later what is the percentage shear wall corresponding plinth as per ndm me of india um, i don't think i don't know uh, what ndm me but uh, what is given in uh, uh, building code tall building code in tall building code some ratio is given so ndm me uh, guidelines are not code so we have to follow the is codes so you can refer Uh, ndma guidelines and uh, if you found those uh, to be more conservative you can use those but you cannot use ndma guidelines to uh, dilute the code okay does this mean mm -hmm. it changes by the time i am reading it somebody writes and then it goes down and then it becomes difficult to you have to check where okay. where, where we are where, where i was okay so let me see uh, i am not going in a sequence whatever okay oh, whatever comes to, comes to my in front of me i will answer that in uh, mm -hmm. okay let me take from the bottom how the cross section to be provided in skeletal modeling okay so uh, cross section will be the same um, as uh, that is uh, there in the actual uh, uh, wall so when we are modeling the flange we will provide the cross section area of the flange when we are modeling the uh, bab we are we will provide the modeling of uh, the area of the bab so cross sectional area will remain same uh, we have to take into account the uh, stiffness modifiers for cracking so those we will take into account what will be the effect of discontinued shear wall in height whether fe model with shell element takes care of this issue no uh, because the problem in any discontinuity is that there will be stress concentration and it will lead to damage concentration so any linear analysis you are performing cannot take care of everything so please be careful when you are doing a, a linear analysis whatever sophisticated model you are making it will not answer all the problems related to earthquake because in case of earthquakes buildings undergo inelastic deformation so uh, you have to think about the issues which will arise after yielding in etas it is permitted to use the stiffness factor point using analysis and same again uh, the person has repeated and uh, <laughs> and when <laughs> he said he, he wrote it again because i started <laughs> reading but i cannot answer this question because i don't understand repeating the question will not help me please tell me in more detail what your question is in my one structures when the walls are supported on girders beams below to provide ld in the beams what does that mean walls cannot be supported on girders so whether that, it is my wall that, that means the walls are discontinued at first floor level most of the places when they yeah, are still here so, yeah. so that, so that is not be, permitted here yeah. that is not permitted that is not to be done whether it is my one or any other construction 
the shear wall has to continue right up to the foundation. <clears throat> so some of the questions are getting repeated in in very difficult for me to answer at this speed <laughs> yeah 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 at this speed <laughs> you cannot write, so, read actually <laughs> if we all using shear wall system can we use 20 cm thick columns avoiding 20 dv criteria no if you are your columns are not connected to any beam you can do it but if the it is these are connected to beams you have to follow 20 dv criteria What is the length of the distributor reinforcement? Please explain. Uh, again, this is from anonymous attendee. Distributor reinforcement where? Uh, in which case? Distributor reinforcement in context of steel uh, coupling beams or where? What is this distributor reinforcement? It is not clear. In coupling beam, it has changed again. According to ACI 318, it states that a collector is a region of a diaphragm that transfer forces between the diaphragm and the vertical element. That means the beam column slab structural system can be designed, can be designated a beam top portion as a collector or the portion where the column and diaphragm or the shear wall and the diaphragm are intersecting with each other shall be denoted as this element as collector. ACI sketches the reinforcement of the collector, shear friction reinforcement. Would you please make me this clear? Actually, I am didn't clear about collector as well as collector reinforcement. Okay, so yes, I agree that uh, the collector design of diaphragm it is not yet very clear in the course. The main idea is that somehow the load which is uh, coming in the shear wall should be transferred. So more details perhaps we will take up sometime later. Uh, maybe next time we have to, similar to the shear wall, we have to have a one session on design of diaphragms. So design of diaphragms for in-plane action. We have been designing slabs for outer plane action. There is no issue about that. But uh, what should be done in in plane? So that we can take up sometimes in future. What is the minimum ratio between columns and shear walls of important buildings? There is no ratio. Okay. If you want your building to design as dual system, if you want to take advantage of dual system, because dual system is having higher response reduction factor as compared to shear wall, then you have to design the frame at least for 25%. If you don't want to design for 25%, you can still design it. But in that case, you have to use response reduction factor that of the shear wall. In that case, your building is not a dual system. So diaphragm related okay. questions, I will try to answer. I do not have uh, readily available answers at the moment. What else? I will go somewhere in the middle and see. <laughs> but by the time I go there, somebody brings me down. <laughs> How to ensure 25%, 75% ratio in dual system while analyzing in software? No, no, no. This is not to be uh, ensured in the analysis. That doesn't mean that you have to uh, change your columns to have 25% force. You have to design it for 25% force. So you calculate the total base here and 
calculate 25 percent of that and then design your columns in such a way for that force that their capacity is 25 percent how much they will actually take will depend upon the stiffness what you have provided so code doesn't say that you have to reduce the size of the shear wall such that the columns are taking at least 25 percent that is not needed but the beams and columns you are having those should be designed you will define a load case and that load case should be defined in such a way that the shear force in the columns is scaled to 25 percent Please don't repeat the questions are like mass mailing. It, it disturbs them. Okay. Yeah. okay. So I think yeah. we will close here and yeah, uh, sure. Sure, sure. remaining questions we will take up, we will compile, we will yeah, we'll compile the duplication. Yeah. And those questions which are not clear, please send us in more detail. Then, then we can. So thank, thank you me. very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you all. Thank you, Apicons, uh, Mr. Kulkarni sir. Thank you so much for arranging and uh, his whole Apicons team, uh, Parulekar sir and Despande sir and others. I may not be even knowing who is there in the background. So thank you so much. Yeah. There is a formal thanks from our side, Yogendra Singh, and to all the participants that you had been attending in a large number. And Yogendra Singh is such a popular and excellent teacher that everybody's love is expressed in terms of attending such session and nearly 70-80% people keep on uh, attending till end. Now our next webinar we will be conducting on, go back, we will be conducting on uh, testing of concrete for long life and advanced NDT. The details are under formation and maybe next past 9 February we send you the invitation. As far as Yogendra Singh is concerned, he has now directly given dates of July. So, yes. <laughs> so if you want to meet him once again on webinar platform, you have to wait till July and we may have a longer course at that time. But like just now he said, he, he, if he picks up some topic and if something is ready, he can always inform us and we can have an unscheduled webinar also. So please stay connected with us and please join again whenever we do any other webinars. We are also into proof checking of tall buildings, structural audit, assessment, NDT, concrete quality monitoring, project management, which are different than structural engineering, what we are talking. And of course, training of various on various subjects and for various categories. So with this, I thank you all and I thank Yogendra Singh, sir, for your great contribution. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.